But with a completed railroad came increased traffic and a plethora of new problems. The greatest of these issues stemmed from the design of the line itself. The vertigo-inducing grades that had necessitated the purchase of Heisler No. 9 would become an even bigger problem as tonnages on the line increased. Furthermore, completion promised a surge in passenger traffic, and while such revenue streams were certainly welcomed by railroad management, the exceedingly sharp, sharp curves of the Angels precluded the standardized passenger equipment of the era from ever making the trip. It was time to go back to the drawing board. To address the issue of motive power, Sierra ownership turned its attention to the Midwest, where a relative newcomer to the locomotive business had been making waves with its innovative designs the better part of two decades. Tucked into a quiet corner of northwestern Ohio, the city of Lima had been a railroad hub since the 1850s, but when a local farm equipment manufacturer bought the patents of a Michigan lumberman named Ephraim Shea in 1882, things really got rolling. So what exactly is a Lima Shea, and how does it differ from a Heisler? To answer that, we once again return to the redwood-studded hills of Felton for another visit with the Roaring Camp and Big Trees. On a basic level, the concept behind these two designs is the same. Use the mechanical advantage of a gear ratio to boost power while incorporating pivoting trucks to allow for flexibility. The difference is simply a matter, matter of layout. For if we accept the Heisler as a V2 steam engine, then the Shea could perhaps best be described as an inline three. A trio of pistons mounted vertically on the side of the boiler turn a crankshaft, which, much like the Heisler, runs through a series of universal joints to reduction gears mounted directly on the wheels. Now detractors will point out that such an off-center mechanism creates an imbalanced torque, but the flip side of that point is that all of these moving parts, this entire driveline mechanism, is exposed, allowing for easy maintenance. Basically, the whole system is designed to be maintained in the middle of the woods by a 15-year-old kid with a ball-peen hammer. It makes the machines perennial favorites of shop crews and would forever earn them the affectionate nickname of Sidewinders. For the Sierra, Lima would change the rules of the game starting in the fall of 1902 with the arrival of locomotive number 10. Only slightly larger than the number 9, Sierra 10 was far and away the most powerful thing on Sierra rails when it arrived a fact that did not go unnoticed by management. Within a few months' time, the 10 spot would be joined by cousins 11 and 12, each being larger and more powerful than any of its predecessors. Meanwhile, on the passenger front, the Sierra looked somewhat closer to home for solutions. They selected a small company on Fremont Street in San Francisco, known as the Holman Car Company, and placed an order for two custom-built coaches. As per the specifications, each car was to be 32 feet long, equipped with 30-inch wheels, Janey couplers, and Westinghouse air brakes. One, one was to be appointed with cherry wood paneling, red velvet upholstery, and brass fixtures, and featured seating for two dozen people. The other was to be a combination car with a baggage compartment in one end and wicker seating for 12 in the other. Although this would later be reduced to 10, as subsequent revisions of the order would replace one seat with an onboard restroom. When these cars were delivered just days before the official opening of service, they were 100% unique in the realm of American railroads, testaments to ingenuity and fodder for modelers and railroad enthusiasts of ensuing generations. And so, with equipment on hand and the final rails spiked into place, the moment of glorious triumph had finally arrived. The scene that day was a far cry from the idyllic pastoral surroundings that you see today. These hillsides were an impromptu grandstand for a crowd of 3,000 people, basically the entire town. A brass band set up shop on the slope immediately behind me. Shops closed, schools let out early. Everybody who was anybody was here. And then, at 2 in the afternoon, 
The sound of a three chime steam whistle echoed across the hills and the glow of a headlight appeared through a shallow cut that way, about 300 yards. The first train from Jamestown had officially arrived and the community of Angel's Camp was now officially a railroad town. Following the inauguration of service, commercial development proceeded quickly along the entire length of the, of the Angel's Yard. A lumber mill, locally owned, sprang up near the yard's south end. Directly across from that, local landowner George Tryon partnered with Oakdale businessman Al Gilbert to build a grain warehouse. These were soon joined by a distributorship of the Standard Oil Company and several smaller warehouses. An ore tipple soon rose to cast its shadow across the north end of the yard, while another lumber firm built a warehouse nearby, a structure that would eventually come to be owned by local growers of feedstock, earning it the nickname of Hay Barn with area residents. For its part, the railroad built a turntable, a water tank, a two-stall engine house, and of course, the, the central structure for every railroad town, a depot. It had been more than half a decade since the day when Tom Bullock first proposed a railroad to the mines of Calaveras County. Along the way, there had been landslides, accidents, material shortages, backroom political deals, and enough legal wrangling to keep an army of lawyers hogtied for a year. At one point, work had stopped for several days when an excavating crew unexpectedly exposed a vein of gold and an entire summer had been wasted in the political swampland that was the banks of the mighty Stanislaus. But now, the summit of that great, insurmountable mountain had been achieved. The Angels Branch was a completed railroad, and with the initiation of service across the length of the line, there dawned the promise of a bright and prosperous future. And then, the darkness closed in once more, as the Sierra experienced its first fatal accident involving the deaths of non-employees. The date, date was June 25th of 1904. At 5 p.m., a work train headed by Heisler No. 9 began ascending the grade behind me, climbing out of Switchback 1. It dragged its five gravel cars and an 8,000-gallon oil tank to a spur track at the top of the hill to clear the main. At quarter past the hour, the regular Angel's passenger train cleared, headed north. Engineer Quackenbush then eased back the Johnson bar of number nine, kicked off his air, and began reversing back onto the main line. Nope, nobody's quite sure what happened next exactly. An investigation report was split between operator error and mechanical failure. But what is known, however, is that this is the moment where all hell broke loose. For despite his efforts at applying the air brakes, and then in desperation, a steam jam brake, Quackenbush's train began to accelerate down the grade. It rounded a curve and came into view of switchback one, causing instant panic amongst conductor Decker and his 40-some-odd passengers, many of whom resorted to leaping out the open windows. Some, sadly, weren't so lucky. When the impact came, it was enough to collapse the platforms of Coach 6 and Combine 5 together, pinning two women in the process. Mrs. Pauline Demartini of Stockton was killed instantly in the crushing carnage, while a woman identified only as Mrs. F. Valenti in the coroner's report wasn't so lucky. She lingered for approximately half an hour after the crash, her mournful wails unnerving the passengers many of whom were nursing severe injuries of their own. It was a dark day to be sure, entirely tragic. But it would pale in comparison to what would occur across the river behind me, exactly two years and one day later. A little over a hundred years ago, this was no place to be standing. At approximately 7 o'clock in the evening, on June 26, 1906, a four-car freight train, pulled by Heisler No. 9, began ascending the grade behind me. In its consist, a carload carrying 15 tons of dynamite. 
It was bound for the Glory Hole Mine at Carson Hill, just beyond the ridge behind me. However, something went wrong that day, and at this very spot, the point where I am now standing, that car unexpectedly and tragically detonated. The two men on duty in the caboose were killed outright. The blast, it was said, was so powerful as to be heard all the way in Stockton, nearly 80 miles distant. Other reports claim that a wheel from that ill-fated boxcar was pitched through the roof of a storage shed at the Rawhide Mine, five miles that way. Talk about getting more bang for your buck. But like any growing business, the Sierra and its builders didn't have the luxury of dwelling on tragedy. Developing their business was their first, second, and third priorities. And so it wasn't long before the divot was filled, the track rebuilt, and trains were once again rolling through the canyons and crags of Calaveras County. However, this is not to say that the twin tragedies of 04 and 06 were forgotten entirely. These unspeakable events would become the genesis of many legends regarding the Sierra Railway's cursed locomotive. For both of these accidents prominently featured Heisler No. 9, and in the ensuing years, this diminutive machine would rack up a record of death and destruction worthy of any Alfred Hitchcock film. Less than six months after the dynamite explosion near Gee Whiz Point, No. 9 was leased to the Standard Lump Company and was promptly involved in a runaway accident that claimed the lives of three crewmen. Later, in 1925, misfortune came calling once again in the form of a head-on collision that seriously injured several employees. By the time she was mercifully scrapped in 1947, Sierra No. 9 had been involved in four serious accidents, resulting in seven deaths and untold personal injury and property pretty damage. Not the sort of scorecard that one would normally aspire to. But even with the damages and lawsuits left in the wake of No. 9's dubious service, the Angels Branch was a going concern for the Sierra Railway and was turning a tidy, if not entirely impressive, profit for its builders. Lumber, oil, agricultural products of all stripes, gravel and gold ore flowed along the length of the line. Heavy equipment and supplies bound for the mines and sawmills of the Sierra backcountry rumbled over its thin rails. Picnic and sightseeing excursions were common events, and when the summer evenings turned warm and long, baseball specials would carry teams and their fans to games throughout the region. The trains of the Angels carried consumer goods, mail, express shipments, and even the occasional celebrity. Most people are familiar with the story of Twain's connection to this area. He came in December of 1864 as a guest of the Gillis brothers and settled in the small cabin Pine May. He had been a man of many careers throughout his life, most of them unsuccessful, and by this point he was earning $50 a month writing a weekly column for a literary review paper in San Francisco called The Californian, edited by Bret Hart. By mid-January, he had assembled a thoroughly forgettable series of articles and was by later admission contemplating suicide. Then, one afternoon, he accepted an offer to be the guest chair at a chapter meeting of the local Masonic Lodge in Angel's Camp and changed his life forever. Following the meeting, Twain came here to the bar of the Angel's Hotel where he soon found himself cornered by a rather talkative bartender by the name of Ben Kuhn. Kuhn related to Twain a local folk tale of sorts about an ill-fated wager involving a frog and a sizable quantity of quail shot. Later, Twain returned to the cabin, and that night, by the flickering light of a single oil lamp, he wrote down, down in broad strokes the story that would put Angel's Camp on the map and make him a legend in his own time. It's worth noting that Twain did not invent the story of Jim Smiley and his frog, Daniel Webster, but he was the first one to get it published. And that is what ultimately made all the difference in the world. So what does any of this have to do with the Angel's Branch? Well, 
By the summer of 1905, the man once known as Samuel Clemens had given up writing for the most part and had settled into a life on the lecture circuit, crisscrossing the country, speaking at various public events. And it was for this purpose that the now famous author returned to the birthplace of his career. By then, the muddy, rutted roads that he had traversed during his previous stay had been supplanted by the speed and comfortable efficiency of the railroad, and Twain took full advantage. He rode the entire line from Jamestown to Angels and back that summer, and remarked to local leaders on what a vast improvement it represented. But celebrity is one thing, profitability is quite another. And while it remained true that the Angels Branch was a money-making venture, that money was not flowing in nearly fast enough to suit the railroad's backers. At times, re revenue was barely enough to keep up with interest payments on the line's construction loans, and the future did not hold much promise. The overall problem was one of timing. The Angels Branch had been built with the intention of serving the dozens of gold mines that had made Calaveras County the economic powerhouse of early California. But by the turn of the century, that very same gold rush had run its course, and while a handful of mines would continue to operate well into the 1920s, the industry was but a shadow of its former self. The bloom was off the rose. The glory days were over. Like a guest arriving at the end of a party, the Sierra was forced to pick through the scattered remnants of what had been a grand celebration of commerce, scavenging for stray pretzels amidst the scraps of an economic buffet that had been picked clean by the celebrants who had come before. Oh, it was perhaps better than nothing at all, but it was a faint shadow of the anticipated grand experience, and everyone involved knew it. And so, as the last golden petals fell from the gilded rose that had been the great California gold rush, the railroad watched helplessly as its margins sank further and further into the financial abyss. By the end of the First World War, the last quarterly profit had been recorded on the accountant's ledger, and the Angels Branch was officially in the red. The 1920s were lean years for the line, with the railroad making many attempts to stem the tide. One such, such effort involved abandoning the use of geared power, which the Jamestown shops were never fully equipped to maintain, and transitioning to an all-rod roundhouse. Heisler 9 and the three Shays were soon packed up and sold to new owners, and a pair of newcomers began making their acquaintance with shop employees. Arriving on Sierra property in 1922, a 262 Prairie-type locomotive was added to the roster and quickly made a home in the roundhouse and an impression on the road. It was designated as number 30 and assigned to an eccentric young engineer named Gus Swanson. Among other eccentricities, Gus was also known for drawing his laundry from windows of the cab and is reported to have once even fallen out of his own train leaving the jaunty number 30 and its suddenly empty cab to trundle merrily away with, without him. And true to nature, he was quick to express his own quirky personality through his new ch charge, ordering shop crews to paint a large star of gleaming silver across the smoke box front. It would earn his machine the nickname of Old Star, and would ensure that everyone would know exactly who was at the throttle on any given day. Overall, Gus's colorful personality meshed perfectly with the laid-back feel of the re region and the shoestring construction of the Angels. His presence and that of his star-spangled engine were widely seen as hallmarks of the era. Gus ran the Angels as if, as if its every curve and climb had been bred into him. On wet and frosty winter mornings, he would thread his way through the Maloney switchbacks with ease, his brakeman riding the pilot beam with a coffee can full of sand an allowance made to the fact that sanding lines and railheads would not align on such tight curvatures. The Angels was his playground in many ways, its 40-pound rails his jungle gym, and for the big kid getting paid to play with trains, life seemed like a dream. Number 30 would be joined by a slightly larger prairie the following year, and together they would assume all duties on the Angels. The days of geared power on the Sierra were at an end, and while some, some of these machines would spend many more years in the Tuolumne County backcountry, helping feed the voracious appetite of the region's lumber industry, their shrill whistles and staccato exhausts would be forever silent along the Railroad of Angels.
Reality can, at times, be a cruel mistress, and adapting one's technology will not change the verdicts of a fickle economy. And with the onset of the Great Depression at de decades end, the Sierra's ledger was engulfed by a sea of red ink. The Swanson Special often ran to Angel's Camp with only Combine No. 5 in tow, referred to by many as Moses Caboose, in reference to conductor Mose Baker, who was often its sole occupant. Although even amidst the economic wreckage of the Roaring Twenties, there were momentarily flashes of optimism. Freight shipments along the line would occasionally spike, warranting rare double-header double trips by both prairies, such as this one, seen departing Jamestown in 1930. And then there was one line-side shipper who offered particular cause for hope. Today, this scraped piece of dirt is an access road running along the eastern boundary fence of the Frog Jump Fairgrounds in Angel's Camp. But in its day, this was the right-of-way for the Angel's Main, and the adjacent property was home of the Greenstone Mine, a quarry oper operation that produced cut stone for major building projects in the region. An uptick of business here in the 1930s prompted the railroad to invest in the construction of a short spur track using 60-pound rail, diverging from the main line at the mouth of the shallow cut behind me and running along the ascending grade here to my left. It was a major investment for a company as cash-strapped as the Sierra was, but desperate times call for desperate measures, and in certain situations, even a Hail Mary pass can be appropriate. This particular pass, however, would fall sadly short. This would be the last new track ever laid along the Railroad of Angels. But the promise found in the quarry at Greenstone, like all other such promises of the Angels, proved to be a false one. Shipments from the quarry dwindled just as quickly as they had peaked, and it was just one of many storm clouds on the economic horizon. 1930 saw the shuttering of the Standard Lumber Company mills, by this time time functioning as a subsidiary of the Pickering Lumber Corporation. Coupled with the closing of the West Side Mill the year before, this meant that the railroad's single greatest source of revenue was almost entirely eliminated. Passenger service across the system was hemorrhaging cash, but restrictive regulations and interstate commerce commission that seemed unconcerned with the plight of such a small backwoods outfit forced the Sierra to remain tied to this financial anchor as it plunged ever deeper into the financial abyss. The company was also saddled with paying off construction bonds related to the defunct Yosemite short line, a boarded 30-inch gauge line that was planned to the famed National Park but ultimately failed to even make its way out of the county. And in the midst of this epic crisis, the Sierra found it had no steady hand at the helm. With the death of Tom Bullock in 1920, overall management of the company passed to general manager C.W. Hamblin. But the pressures of keeping a floundering company afloat and dealing with reversals in his own private finances proved too much and a few days before Christmas in 1930, Hamblin stepped out the back door of his home in Jamestown and shot himself. For the Sierra Railway, it, it was all simply becoming too much. Between crushing debt and dwindling revenue, the railroad was caught between the gargantuan jaws of an economic vice. Something had to give, which it finally and mercifully did on November 30th of 1934. That day, the ICC at last relinquished its glacial pace long enough to render a judgment, and the struggling company jumped at the chance. The end game would come the following spring. March 1st dawned bright and crisp that year, but the mood in Angel's camp was anything but chipper. That afternoon, with neither flash nor fanfare, Gus Swanson and his firemen laid their backs into the Armstrong turntable at the north end of the yard and gave their girl a final spin. Satisfied that all was as it should be, Gus then climbed into the cab and eased the Johnson bar forward, easing his way through the yard switches at walking speed, 
pausing just long enough to offer his gal a drink from the wooden water tank that sat perched precariously on a hillside south of the hay barn. Then, pulling up to a point just short of the Gilbert Tryon granary, his fireman switched tracks and the diminutive Baldwin tiptoed its way back to the depot with its recently extended freight platform to couple with the number five, its lone charge for the day. The event stood in stark contrast to the day more than 32 years prior when virtually the entire town turned out to, to watch the wonderment of the train's first arrival. Now, hardly a soul was present to pay witness as Gus gave a final check of his watch and offered two quick tugs of the whistle cord, waiting just long enough for the mournful five-chime wail to echo off the surrounding hills before kicking off his air and gently pulling back on the throttle. The star-bedecked prairie responded slowly, almost reluctantly at first, as if unwilling to leave its adopted home. But it soon complied, and Gus and company de departed the City of Angels for the last time, leaving little more than rusted rails and a trunk full of memories in their wake. The, the era of the railroad in Calaveras County was over. <laughs>